Good morning. morning. Welcome to this sacred time, this community consecrated by our presence and our commitment. I'm Michael Griffith, recently elected your treasurer elect and also worship associate this morning. Whether you are here in the church building or using the internet to attend service with us, we welcome you to the Unitarian Universalists of Transylvania County where our mission is to support individual spiritual journeys and to promote social, economic, and environmental justice. And in the words of Ma Teresa Tet Gustillo Gallardo, there's my temple, believer, unbeliever, or wild one. You are welcome. We have no definition of who we are but human. We have no code but that of respect. We have no creed but that of equality. There's my temple, identity seeker, sinner, stateless or not, you're welcome. We have no constraints on expression but space. We have no code but to listen to poetry between the silence and the surrender. There's my temple, nature tripper, urban dweller or saint, you're welcome. How shall we divide the world but by our breaths? We have no pope above us, so no infallible bull. We have no judgment but in terms of harm. There's my temple, history maker, marginalized, unorganized, you're welcome. We have no covenant among us but mutual assistance. We insist on no assumptions and doubt moral facts. We are free to theorize with emotion and call it hope. There's my temple. Unbecoming, expert, robe or disrobe, you are welcome. We have no dwarfs or giants. Goliath fell long ago. We have no seal on revelation. Tentative is truth. Lead by your desires and serve by your power. There's my temple. Funny temperamental, shy, or wise, you're welcome. There is not one way of being human, not even Superman. We have no world but that which we create together. There is as much wisdom and harmony as in dissent. Aren't those wonderful words? Wow, I wish I'd written that. (laughs) Thank you for wearing masks, signing on the clipboards, and following all the protocols that we practice here in the eye of the COVID situation. And thanks to choir for taking COVID tests this morning. If there's a deep joy or concern in your heart to share with this community, ask an usher for a piece of paper. Those of you who um, are at home may write something in the chat box. We'll add these notions and prayers and and requests that you have that sign on the sheets there to the pastoral uh, prayer from Reverend Bob. Yesterday, UUTC was the host of the Faces of Freedom this African American Heritage Month. Those of you who missed it on our live stream will find it in the coming days posted with some technical glitches that occurred fixed. This was a multi-part history and fashion presentation. Our service will begin with these words by Viola Abbott. Reverend Abbott is the minister at the Coastal Virginia Unitarian Universalist in Virginia Beach. She's a member of the Journey Toward Wholeness Transformation Committee of the UUA. Here are her words. We are Unitarian Universalist. When we lift up our seven principles, some of us think of them as a form of theology, but they are more important to our collective than that. They do not tell us what we should believe, but rather tell us how we should be. They tell us how we should act in the larger world and with each other. 
We are brought together here today by the fact that Unitarian Universalism has fallen short of the image that was presented to the world and to many of those who embrace this religion. But we are now shifted course toward a place of wholeness, a place that perhaps never existed for us as a denomination. It's been a long and sometimes unforgiving road to today, but we are here today because we are mindful of the past and because we have a hope for the future. We want the practice of this faith to be a fulfilling manifestation of its course, of its promise. Open your hearts, seek new ways of understanding. Come, let us worship together. The chalice lighting is begun by these words by the Reverend Sarah Lambert, who currently serves as the Unitarian Universalist Association as the co-director of ministries and faith development. The element of fire represents passion, veracity, authenticity, and vitality. The element, I'm sorry, if the chalice is the supporting structure of Unitarian Universalism, then we are the flame. We are the flame fanned strong by our passion for freedom, our yearning for truth telling, our daring to be authentic with one another and the vitality we sustain in our meeting together. In all of this, there is love. John Austin will now direct the choir in our first hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, feel free to stand and hum along or sway. Thank you. Good morning. Will all the kids come up here with me, please? This is the time for wisdom for all ages. And this month, y'all probably know that our theme is widening the circle. And we're going to look at that today with the kids. And later in the children's class, we're going to look at what's known as asylum seekers or people who are refugees. And we think about opening ourselves or widening the circle, we can sort of think about it in terms of a rubber band. Rubber bands, guys, you'll see these, are kind of like people. You can come up here with me if you want, everybody. Can this too? Uh, don't grab them just yet, Jack. Jack. But rubber bands are like people. We're all different sizes, different shapes, different colors, and we have different abilities or different 
ways we can stretch and get bigger. Some of these stretch a little bit. Some can stretch a lot a bit, guys. And, but you can only stretch so far. And if we want to stretch further, sometimes it helps to have others to help us. So if we come together, we can start stretching even further if we work together. So Cadence, you want to help me with this? We're just going to, I'm going to pull this little one right here. So together, two rubber bands are stretching a little bit more. Jack, you want to help me with this? Pull this red, red end right here too. Pull it right here. We're going a little further. Jacob, you want to add one to Cadence's end? And we're slowly able to stretch more and more and widen that circle. And this is the same way that we as people can keep stretching. Can you add one more on that end and one more on this end? Jack? And as people, we can work together to stretch and to grow and to be more encompassing, more growing, more stretching. We're widening the circle to accept more and more people in. And a little bit later today with the kids, we're going to learn about people who are refugees who are needing to be welcomed in and widening the circle. And if we work like these rubber bands together, we can take more and more people in and be together. All right, now Cadence will light our children's candle and we'll head to the class. We ask everybody just to wave us out when the music starts. Sharing life passages among our beloved friends makes this feel more like a connected community, even if many are still practicing separation. Our shared joys become a celebration and our named sorrows become part of our prayers and support for one another. The candles we light are more broadly general and the prayer that follows will include specifics. If you wish to share at this time, and I hope you've already sent these up to Reverend Bob, those of you at home can put the information on the chat box and we will dedicate a candle to all of those concerns at once. We light a candle for those who entered careers to serve others and who may be worn out from the added burdens and work shifts during wave and wave of hospital overloads over these past two years or school policies, or procedural changes, or high pressure delivery schedules. We light a candle for those milestones shared in the online chat. We light a candle for those around the world worried about war and invasion and the devastations that inevitably come from these sorts of human conflicts. We light a candle for the Olympic teams and coaches who set aside nationalism in the name of fair competition. We light a candle for the athletes playing in today's Super Bowl who have found a way to join arm in arm, black and white, and merge their diversity, find tolerance, and eliminate racism. We light a candle for those facing grief and loss, as well as those seeking health treatments during this time full of hospitals. Let's pause a moment to reflect on these candles.
continuing in this prayerful spirit. Part of the prayer this morning, I rely on the words of my colleague, the Reverend Ann Mason from First Parish in Lexington, Massachusetts. Let us start, though, with a reflection of the glow of each of these candles and all that we hold, spirit of love and life. Let us hold in our hearts all those things which are appearing in our lives, in our world. For all the athletes, for all the peoples of the world who are facing, as Michael said, war. In particular, this morning, too, let us call out, O Spirit of love and life, for love and support and prayers to Lee Rush, prayers for a peaceful transition as he leaves this body, that he may well know how much he is loved and feel complete. And our prayers go out specifically to those who are returning home, Jill Beach or others who have been facing surgeries and need time to mend, to Ann Rab, to others. And though we may not name each and everything we hold in our hearts, in our thoughts, there will be a time for that, for that sharing, for that love, for that support. O oh, spirit of love and life, let us not forget on this weekend or any other the need for our universal love of each other through all points and times of joys and struggles. These, the prayers of our hearts, thoughts of our minds we hold now through the music and we say amen blessed be
Thank you so much to the choir. You know, we all have gifts to offer. I was listening on the radio on the way in about a church that had a preacher who couldn't sing. Every time the preacher sang, the choir would get a face. <laughs> but I love singing. It's one of the gifts that I'm sorry we don't all get to share so much. And then we have folks who come on into leadership. Like, you know, a few weeks ago, Michael was just a worship associate, and now Michael's treasurer elect. You never know when you step forward to do something how many other things we're going to pile on. <laughs> and I'm sorry again that you're not all able to do that. But here's the chance. Each of you right now could put some money in the basket. <laughs> and I know that there, there, there are those among us for whom putting something in the basket is just as tough as being treasurer elect or singing in key. I understand that. But each of us has our own ways of giving our gifts and now May we gratefully receive the morning off. And what is given with great love, we receive with joy. And we say thank you. We have a responsive reading for the reading this morning. And uh, it's by Julia Corbett Haymeyer. And I invite you to rise in the way you are willing and able and sing the italic part. I will read the first line and then uh, you go on with the ita italics version of this. In the face of hate. In the, answer, call to love. In the face of exclusion. In the face of homophobia. In the face of racism. In the face of xenophobia. In the face of misogyny. In the face of demagoguery. In the face of religious intolerance. In the face of narrow nationalism. In the face of bigotry. In the face of despair. 
as Unitarian Universalists, we answer the call of love.
in this month in which our theme is widening circles. As we heard this morning from Kevin and the demonstration with the rubber bands, there are ways of helping us each stretch and become something more all-encompassing of what we can do. A piece of this on this Valentine's weekend is all embracing love, but rather than talk about schmaltzy ties, and little candies, uh, those little candies that say be mine on them and all of that, I want to talk about universalism. As we talk about Unitarian Universalism and the widening circles that occurred due to universalism and our own Unitarian history as well. I'd like to point out calendar things too. Let's get the calendar out of the way first before we get into messaging. All right, so we know Valentine's Day is tomorrow. For any of you who are thinking of forgetting that special someone, here you go. Also, this month in 1658 in Transylvania, the Edict of Torta was an expression when probably one of the earliest, if not the earliest, of a government affirming people's rights for religious freedom and to some extent a religious diversity that had never been seen before and has been fought over since. That was due to Unitarian King and his mother the Queen wishing for others to be able to worship in their own ways with full citizenship rights. So the Edict of Tord is a big deal. Also coming up this week, on the 17th is Random Acts of Kindness Day. So on that day, you figure out what you're going to do and spread around kindness in ways that are random and not earned. That's actually a religious concept. Grace happens. And maybe we can be part of that. This is also Black History Month, as I mentioned before, and I lift up Viola Abbott's reading this morning that had in its words, we have a vision we have failed to meet as Unitarian Universalists in our ability to be diverse. But now into the meat of our sermon. I'm going to start out with a quote from Gordon McKeeman, the Reverend Gordon Bucky McKeeman uh, is a now gone colleague of mine in uh, Unitarian Universalism, present at my ordination. Gordon McKeeman said at one point, Universalists believe that all of us are going to end up together in heaven. So we might as well learn how to get along with each other now. <laughs> I like that one. Here we are, a powerful message of love for all the ages that the, these universalists said, hey, we're all going to heaven. And, and there was a there was a thing about church bells. If you sat and listened to church bells, you, this is from the last century, uh, I guess when more church bells were, were ringing and people lived closer to them, that on the Sunday morning you could hear the Methodist church bells ringing, repent, repent, repent. <laughs> and then next the Presbyterians would ring, come to church, come to church, come to church, it's time. And the Universalist bell would be ringing, and it would say, no hell, no hell, no hell, and all the people would stay home. <laughs> that was the fear of Universalism spreading in America, that without the fear of hell, why would anybody 
hold it together. Everybody would become thieves and murderers. Nobody would come to church. The society would fall apart. Perhaps society has fallen apart. But it's not the Universalists, because the Universalists were preaching, in fact, what Bucky McKeeman said. All right, if we're all going to end up in heaven, we might as well learn to get all along now. We're not the first people to have come up with these concepts. I mean, we know that going back at least to the second temple period of Judaism, there was this whole idea that all nations would end up able to worship the one God. That there was in that time some thought that even though different peoples called God by different names, there was some writing from back in the period saying to those, well, maybe you call Zeus, or maybe you have a different name, but there is one God. That was a universalism in a way of saying everybody can come to the holy, not just one chosen tribe all the nations began to be said in that time period. Where the religious structure begins to shift is that that God would become favorable to all. You think out, out when the world first began, there was a bit of a rift in the first family. We have all sorts of fundamentalists saying, be more like Adam and Eve. Well, Adam and Eve were not good parents because they raised Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel went off and did their own things. They were diverse. One raised crops and vegetables. The other raised meats. And we got the vegetarians versus the omnivores in the very first. And Cain got upset because he was the vegetarian guy, and apparently God didn't like the smell of burnt vegetables. But God liked the smell of burnt meat. So what happens? The very first chance of somebody saying, well, all right, God may love us both, but God loves my brother more, so how do I take care of that? Cain came up with a solution that did not help us stretch our rubber bands of being better people. We need the balance of religion to not only say all of us can come to God in our own way, vegetarians or meat eaters, we need us to believe even better that we can all be together, that we are, in fact, all worthy of heaven. Lisa Freeman, my colleague, had these words that Michael found on the web and wanted to pass along. Love is a choice. Whether we're at the bedside of a loved one dying at the side of a stranger we've only just met, the love which inspires the courage and commitment of such choices is not a sweet or sentimental kind of love. Rather, it's a love that recognizes the greater good and the bonds of kinship of which we are part. What was God's question to Cain? Where is your brother? And we need to have that kind of kinship of our sibling, whatever gender, of whatever nation, And we have to, as Lisa Freeman later said, once we accept that love is a choice, then we must also come to terms where the choice may lead us. If love comes from God, there can be no exceptions. Love cannot be just for one or some of us. This is a challenge, like I said, of Cain and Abel, but it's a challenge all along. When Jesus was preaching to the Pharisees, the Pharisees were always testing and prodding Jesus and asking the question and making Jesus tell stories and seeing if they could catch Jesus in some kind of trip up. And Jesus always managed to wiggle through. And there's this, this one time 
in what Jesus was explaining, and it's in Matthew, and you can read it if you want to go and turn to the kind of translation you want. I'm going to paraphrase it, and people are going to say, no, you missed the nuance of it. Actually, this congregation won't do that. I, I get it. Maybe somebody out there will. But, but I get it from Matthew that here Jesus was saying, you know, who was it who was helpful? Who was it who was leading the life that we're called by God to f find? You know, how are we to be with one another? And the Pharisee says, well, yeah, well, the first person in what you said. And say, yeah. And guess what, Pharisees? You think you're all going into heaven first. Now, Jesus didn't have to explain this. By then, it was pretty clear in human nature, even from Cain and Abel's time, that even if we accept God's love, are we saying, well, but, all right, but who gets to sit at God's right hand? Or who gets to be first? Or who's loved more? Or whatever else. And I will tell you, and if you are a Pharisee, you still get into heaven. That's what I read in that scripture. But you get into heaven after the tax collectors and the harlots. <laughs> if you happen to think like a Pharisee and you think you're better than others, and you think you follow religion just perfectly, and you're kind of worried that maybe you'll be last in line to get into heaven, I will say I did some research online and the IRS has openings. <laughs> and there are a couple of uh, North Carolina taxing authorities that are looking for people who can help out with property taxes. So you have a chance. If you're one of those competitive people, well, I know I'm getting into heaven, but I want to get in line before them. Go ahead. You notice I wasn't telling you whether you'd be a harlot or not, but <laughs> IRS has openings. Go for it, folks. But that's not the way I, as a Unitarian Universalist preacher, think that we should do this. Benjamin Rush, the, the uh, signer of the, of the Declaration of Independence, was it? And in Philadelphia, a physician said, a universalist, universalist, who signed founding documents. I, I was told by Martin Marty, my professor at University of Chicago, that that makes universalism a mainline denomination. If you can trace it all the way back to the founding fathers in America, we're a mainline, all right? Because yay, Benjamin Rush, be a radical, sign a document. Benjamin Rush said this, a belief in God's universal love to all creatures and that God will finally restore all of them that are miserable to happiness is a polar truth. It establishes the equality of humanity. So again, we have somebody who's preaching against that who's first in line thing. It establishes the equality of, now I don't think he used the word humanity. It's in brackets in the one, in the quote that I found. So I think he was using language of the time that was very specifically gendered but I don't think he meant it as just one gender. It establishes the equality of humanity. Universalists weren't always that great at diversity in their congregations. Now, here in the South, there might have been a lot of uh, cultural stuff steeped in that made it hard for universalists to talk about everybody being equal. But that's not the fault of Quill and Shin, a universalist circuit rider in the South. I don't know. He said that in a three-year period, he'd done 15,000 miles of circuit riding. How do you do that? This guy died over 100 years ago, and the pictures of him are on a horse. How do you put on 15,000 miles? I'm sure that one horse did not put on 15,000 miles. <laughs> but he, he went all over the place until finally he was assigned. He was born in Virginia. 
in a part that got split off in the Civil War, uh, became West Virginia, but he was born in Virginia. He was assigned to Southern states and helped found congregations. Quillen Shin, when he was appointed Universalist missionary to the South, um, listed among his accomplishes, uh, accomplishments as missionary to the Southern states, uh, in play, uh, playing a leading part in establishment of the missions in Norfolk and Suffolk, Virginia, to serve African Americans, but also the Friendly House mission in the mountains of Western North Carolina, another diverse pocket that might have been different here in the mountainous regions and foothills. Shin was quoted as saying, no one can be a universalist who did, whose love did not take in all races and colors. And he would have been saying that in the 1890s as Jim Crow was rising to ascendancy. Once you know that this message of divine love, and I've been using the word God because I'm preaching from those old universalist stances, but we're good. We're good at drawing the circle of what includes God in the terms for it. Once you know that, once you know that and you're no longer trying to trick your way into feeling superior as in Matthew 21 in the Pharisees, once you know that everybody out there can be worthy of love and are equals, what do you do with it? Well, some people go inward with it. When I was in college, I took a religion class and we went on a field trip to Trappist, Kentucky, to the Gethsemane Monastery. And that's where Thomas Merton had been. Um, those of you who remember back his writings up to when he died in the 1960s, Thomas Merton, very deeply reflective, taking on being a monk, being a Trappist monk. I love the idea that they were praying for all, but I like the idea of what it meant for somebody to be touched by a universalist moment, I'll say, even though he's a Catholic grounded monk, he talked about, and there's a plaque for it, in Louisville at what was called then the corner of Fourth and Walnut. And they've renamed the street, and so I think they've renamed it for Thomas Merton down there. But right there, he's just standing there in the shopping district of Louisville and was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization, he says these are his words, the realization I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like walking out into reality, I'm paraphrasing here, instead of a dream. He felt like he was no longer isolated. He felt such joy in that moment of that, that flood of connection and love. And he said in the end, as if, all, if, if, as if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me, now that I realize we all are a member of this race in which God became incarnate. There's no way of telling people, he said, that they're walking around shining like the sun. He was hoping that people would have those mystical moments themselves to embrace this. And I'm saying universalism, everyone. This is transformative, folks, because if you're already getting away from the idea that some people are in and some people are out, you're not fighting over fashion or who's first in line. You're instead realizing and opening yourself to the flood of beauty and the secret that we are all connected in love and in the divine. This is incredibly powerful. 
this is transformative. The, the other way it goes, the other way it goes is it makes us realize we have to work harder. Do you remember our opening words? Do you remember the readings leading up to this point? We are asked to live up to the religion that we so gladly embrace. Yesterday, this pulpit was taken from this space. And instead, it became a place for a fashion show for African clothing. Our screens showed artwork from African Americans of all ages in our community. Our tech crew ran videos of people thinking back over 50 years to when schools were becoming integrated, talking from the African American perspective. We are a part of this community. We open our space to be able to see the beauty and the connection in all. Thank you for whatever you do in recognizing the love. Oh, go ahead and be schmaltzy. Give flowers and kisses to somebody you love. Remember the special loves of your life on this Valentine's weekend. I'm going to go off and do singing Valentine's with my barbershop quartet. But when it comes down to it, remember those church bells that ring out, no hell, no hell, no hell. And it doesn't mean stay at home. It means bring that message out into the world deep into your heart so that you feel that love too and out into the world. That was our closing quotes. I read again from our responsive reading. In the face of religious intolerance, we answer the call of diversity. In the face of narrow nationalism, we answer the call of global community. In the face of bigotry, we answer the call of open-mindedness. In the face of despair, we answer the call of hope. As Unitarian Universalists, we answer the call of love now more than ever. And thank you to our colleague from the Philippines, Reverend Tet Gallardo, for those words. Blessings on all of you. And now will you join in rising, if you wish, as you're willing and able, but not singing, except those people over there who've been tested. Our final hymn this morning, Number 131, Love Will Guide Us.
in a lovely sentiment of universalism that is ascribed to a founder of American universalism and turns out isn't his words. Go out into the highways and byways. Give them not hell, but hope. May you share the love of this chalice flame and this religion first in your hearts so that you believe and then with the others that they may hear in your voice the echo of that bell. No hell, no hell, no hell. Blessing be. See you again. Thank you. Thank you.